uranium's getting up around $100 a pound. Like none of this is is not going to not going to be enough supply brought on. So until we get there, um, it's a very very low um, uh, very low risk, great risk reward. And so yeah, I'm just hanging out more in the equities because I know they're going to have some pretty heavy talk compared to the um, the physical itself. <laughs>Hey guys, and welcome to Capital Cosm. Today I have a very special guest on the show, Mr. Trader Ferg. Thank you for coming on, my friend. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Definitely. Uh, I'm sure uh, the audience will be very glad to have you on. Um, before we get started on nothing in this video is financial advice, neither uh, Ferg nor I are financial advisors. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money, your, your responsibility. Okay, so Trader Ferg, for the people who may not know who you are, Tell us about yourself. Who are you and what got you into investing? Cool. Well, I am a full-time trader. I'm living in Bali. I've been here for five, coming up, yeah, six years now, actually. Um, I originally, or if you can't tell from the accent, I'm a Kiwi. Grew up on a farm in New Zealand. Uh, went to university studying agriculture. Decided that wasn't for me. Uh, went into property um, management and development, ended up in Australia, got into asset management, met my mentor, Brad McFadden, who runs a fund and been mentored by him for coming up 10 years now and managed to put some uh, capital together and went off with a few high net worth investors. When I turned 30, left the corporate world, traveled the world for a little while, um, Berlin, and then uh, ended up in Bali where I met my now wife. And um, yeah, we've been, as I said, yeah, here, um, here is six years now for a little baby, uh, just turned four months old um, and yeah, really Congrats. enjoying life. Only really started with an online presence in COVID just because I was bored <laughs> and trading could be quite lonely. So when we had the whole lockdown, started um, posting on Twitter and doing a few interviews and I get resonated with people and yeah, here I am a few years on, still, still doing it. Yeah. I mean, I haven't made it as big as you have, but I can, you know, from the last several months that I've been online on Twitter and just kind of running this channel, um, you come to realize like you make so much, so many connections that you wish you'd have, you'd have done yeah. it years ago. Like it's insane. Yeah. Like, yeah. like I get to and interview it's... people like you and yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying like, it's a, it's amazing. One of the, one of the things I realized quickly was um, just the whole sort of, um, what do you call it? Like a positive feedback loop when you get one smart person and then they hear what you're doing. They're like, oh, let me introduce you to the other person. And um, it's just this beautiful, like just introduction chain that is so beneficial. Like the amount of money I've made just having people to, like I mentioned, oh, I'm looking at this like company, but I don't know about this. And someone's like, well, I've got this guy that's an expert in that form of restructuring. Let me put you in touch. And then after talking to him, he goes, oh yeah, no, it's not an issue because of this. And then you feel because of that conversation, I've had some investments where I've like doubled my investment because I was like, that was my main concern. Like I don't have a big enough margin of safety. Then coming away from the chat, you're like, that's not an issue at all. I'm going to go heavier. Yeah. And so just that without any of the, any of the sort of monetizing or following or anything, just the value add of that has been massive. If, if anything, I've, I've kind of said this a few times, what I did with Crux, a, um, a big kind of incentive was I'm inherently an in introvert and it's actually been financially incentivized to go out and find smart people to interview as well was actually in my own self-interest. Like if didn't like just being pushed to chat to people and reach out and they ignore you and you have to reach out again. And the conversations that worthwhile, that the financial incentive was actually more in my benefit to have that chat. So yeah, anyway, let's wrap it in on now, but I've um, found it super beneficial. Yeah, you pick up a bunch of skills you weren't incentivized to pick up as an employee or as a nine to fiver. If that's you know, if you've if you've ever been um, you know one at any point in your life, uh, but just like I mean, like you said, just connections, the expansion of the network that you have, um, and just also crafting like your presentation skills um, over mm -hmm. and over again. Just having all these reps uh, is just, I mean, it's 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 invaluable stuff. So I mean, I know I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, so let's dive into the commodities, which is what everyone wants to talk about. Uh, what's your current take on the commodity, the state of the commodity market? We had a big 200% run in commodities from 
mid 2020 to early 2022, uh, we've been kind of trading down, if not sideways, over the last um, you know year or so. So, uh, why do you think that is? Well, I think there's this like narrative essentially that um, we're out the back end of the energy crisis. It's like just reading the room and looking at futures prices across where it be um, WTI, whether it be Newcastle Coal. It just when you you look out, it all looks like um, everyone's putting the whole prices down to the Russian invasion and it's all being solved. We're out the back end of it and there's um, no issues moving forward. I feel like we're kind of like in the eye of the storm. Uh, my view obviously differs from that a lot. I think, I don't know what percentage I would give of the commodity spike to Russia, but I think the underlying cause is just this um, overinvestment and in unproductive assets, low um, energy return on investment, a low energy density, however you want to word it pouring a lot of money into stuff that just simply cannot provide the excess energy that we need um, and maintain the sort of growth trajectory of um, to keep up with energy demand. And I can go into my views on like why energy demand is so robust and why it's so strong, but um, that's, I think we're going to see it um, this winter in the Northern hemisphere is just the realization that actually it's not purely the Russian issue. It's this this issue of underinvesting in productive assets, trying to kill the assets that are high um, that that are providing the surplus. This sort of demonization of fossil fuels, and um, and we have really we're so far behind um, where we need to be with sort of um, generation capacity that it's just going to make it super hard for the better part of a decade, I believe. Yeah, yeah, and 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 again, you did have that big like tripling of the com of the commodity index in like the span of a year and a half or something like that. So, I mean, you look at yeah. other commodity spikes or commodity super cycles in the past; it's not just a straight line, too, right? No, yeah, no, it's like inflation. Look at inflation in the seventies; it's spiked down. Um, everyone thinks it's over a spike again. Kind of like the the thing that you always get caught out with a lot of these narratives is people focusing in on like rate of change and then attaching a narrative when you should really just be looking at the absolute level. Yeah. So it's kind of like that, that was always a problem with inflation. Like inflation is always inherently spiky. It jumps up, comes back. So it's similar. Like you could, I guess a, a better analogy is probably like, um, like natural gas, like TTF, like that's always spikes um, and settles in, in the summer months before spiking again. And each spike has progressively been bigger. And so someone can always tie a narrative to why it's like rolled over the last few months and that the problem's solved. But if you zoom out, you see that the problem's just getting worse and worse. And that's that's my take is now is just an opportunity to really um, to double down on a lot of these, whether it be oil, whether it be coal, whether it be uranium. I think all of them probably going to largely move together. If you looked at the sort of energy crisis in the past, it will ultimately all all run together. And so it's just a kind of a hunt now for what's the scarcest um commodity like i've got this whole theory around like last the last few decades it's kind of been a since you've been in a deflationary period you've had stuff like the network effect take off which was just really a way to kind of have a bit of a moat and maintain growth in a period when it was hard to get growth and now i think moving forward that we're going into a structural inflation and the way that you're going to kind of have a um, a moat is finding something that's been you that's been built with extremely cheap energy that can't be replicated moving forward in sort of a period of um of very scarce energy you've had so much sort of what you want to call it embodied energy embedded energy there's lots of different ways to describe it like a, a prime example would be like a I've used Peabody before they acquired a mine for sort of 5 billion and then it's been completely um, written down in the bankruptcy proceedings. So you got that on the books for next to nothing. It could be um, oil rigs where um, they were built for for um, just under a billion and the, the, um, they've gone through bankruptcy and now all the debt's been wiped out. So you've essentially got those assets for cents on the dollar. It's just doing this hunt around the world and finding where you're going to get this really fat moat because not only have you got asset for cents on the dollar, it's going to be really hard to recreate those assets, kind of like using rigs, the whole 
um, sort of shipyard, the whole production chain has um, all gone bankrupt. No one wants to produce them anymore. Like the the finance isn't there as well because no one wants to create an asset with a sort of a 20, 20 year lifespan when supposedly we will be off oil by then. The kind of even the, the cash down, like you could originally back in sort of the 2010-11 could um, put 10% down to start building a rig. Now they're demanding sort of 40-50%. And so that, that just appeals to me is that's like a really, a really fat moat that's going to give you a long, long time of higher elevated rates before it can be sort of the invariable sort of commodity over um, sort of create an oversupply situation by stuffing order books, like, yeah, just overordering, kind of like what always happens in every sort of, whether it be tankers, any shipping industry, rigs, they always overorder and and stuff it up at a, on a long enough time frame. Yeah, and to um, kind of, you know, pour gas on the fire, no pun intended there, mm. uh, you, you also have, you know, the rate hikes, which are, mm. ironically, the intention is to bring down inflation through killing demand. But mm. it's ironically, it'll increase inflation down the line because it's making financing a lot harder to get, you know, to your point there, right? Because, you know, mm. financing at 500 basis point Fed funds rate, it's a lot harder today than it was one, two years ago. So it'll put an even more you know, downward pressure on supply um, in terms of like a first order, second order effect down the line. Yeah, it was just cost inflation across like, We've lived in this period of easy money and cheap energy, and we're going out of both of those. So, like, yeah, whether you you go through the cheap energy side, which was just like China, 7X and coal, the shale boom, or you go down the angle of cheap money, which was just ever decreasing interest rates and more sort of money being thrown around with less, like just on poorer and poorer projects. Like, like the easy, easiest way to explain, like, the big level macro and my view is just that the um, US, if you were just to view it like a person, they've got their income, they've got their expenses, their income hasn't been matching their expenses for a while. And they're just constantly making that balance work with like a credit card. But that credit card had sort of a zero interest component. And now that that, um, that credit card interest rates coming, coming home to bite, they, um, they just can't make it work. And yet, unlike... A person which would have to go bankrupt, they're going to have to keep printing that difference because they've got the ability, obviously, to, to print. And so that's what the end game is. And my view is that they're just, it's going to blow out its balance sheet. And so once you understand that pretty much all roads lead to that, they're not going to go with austerity. They're not, not going to default. You understand that you just need to search out hard physical assets. And that's what leads me to where I was going, was just going through bankruptcy, which is like, where are these assets that have had the most um, energy put on they're the hardest to replicate they have the biggest moat where can I find them that's generally the most hated areas that have gone through a bankruptcy cycle and yeah, the other two that come to mind are coal and offshore uh, drillers and, and a lot of tankers also fit yeah nice so uh, so you would say you know you're uh, I guess for lack of a better term your favorites at the moment are, are those two offshore drillers and, and coal and tank yeah I, I do still have a large position yeah yeah and uranium but that's i just don't talk about it because i always i got in early i uh, really loaded the boat and in, in sort of march 2020 and um i hate people that just kind of talk their book the whole time and try and like i haven't added much to it it's the thesis is still strong and i think it's just a waiting game um but the offshore is the most interesting at the moment because really hasn't moved that much. And I think, yeah, you get in at a, at a great level. So that's why I've, over the last sort of six months, I've been really heavily focused on where the value is in the, the sort of offshore space, whether it's the, the drill ships, semi-subs, whether it's the OSVs, like all the service vehicles around, and even looking into like some of the different shipping markets, like the product tankers, uh, the sort of dirty tankers, just seeing where where is the like the opportunity there? Where is the most scarcity? Where are you getting them? The most where are you getting assets at the sort of the biggest discount to their replacement cost, and where I think their replacement cost is going to be um, multiples higher in the future. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've actually been keeping up with, uh, with the drillers and tankers. And one thing you notice is that they've actually been holding steady despite the drawdown yeah. in oil, which is kind of, mm -hmm. sort of like a signal in and of itself. Like what, what is, what is that trying to tell us? Well, I think a certain amount of it is, um, the sort of the retail investor participation. Like it's, um, I was actually just having this chat with my mentor and, um, uh, you've always got to be careful when a narrative um, catches on with retail because then you get all this sort of the people that are in there for a quick buck and will get washed out. It's almost why you see the kind of the way markets work is you get a big run up, it often peaks out, it has to lose sort of 20, 30% of that move, go sideways for a year. That's just getting rid of like the tourists is the way I view it. Yeah. And then you get the next next leg up. And we, I've built a little a little sort of um, portfolio recently and it's just been um, just looking for the real like liquid stuff still within the offshore and I was hunting around in Singapore and a lot of the stuff's like sub like 100 million. It's interesting, like I formed a little portfolio and that despite even the XES, like the the broad equal weighted uh, oil service ETF being down 20%, these, if you'd had a basket of these little stocks, they're up 20% um, on average. And so they just, they don't care about the broad market. It's kind of uncorrelated because there's no retail um, left in them. They've all been washed out. It's either insiders that know what's happening with their company. You see them buying like crazy. There's a few like deep value investors that um, know what they're in for. They're in there for depressed valuations and they're not selling out on a 20% move. Or you got the bag holders that have been in there for <laughs> years, and they're hoping one day to get back to where they got in, which is probably uh, yeah five or ten bagger from where it is currently. And so those are the people you're going in with, and so then it really breaks the correlation to the the broad market. And it, it's something I love. Like I, I recently interviewed a fund manager who does frontier markets, and just the fact some of these you actually have to fly to the country to set up a brokerage. Um, and so it's just completely um, uncorrelated with what broad markets are doing because there's just no sort of there's no there's no linkage there's no flows it's um, just based on its fundamentals which is far more attractive to me yeah than today's sort of schizophrenic markets at times. Wow! So flying over to foreign countries just to set up a brokerage account? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's, I mean, how many do you have? I haven't I haven't started doing it yet. It's um, it's on the to-do list, hopefully with a, a bigger exit from some of my plays at the moment. Yeah, at the moment, I've got vast majority of my net worth just in um, a few IB accounts. But yeah, yeah I, li I like the idea of um, bouncing around a few of these countries like Uzbekistan, like some countries in Africa. Um, and just like one, one of his um, one of his like phrases, Michael McGoldy, that I loved was he calls them like double negatives. Like you wait, you find like a, a country in a crisis so ideally going in a currency crisis when it just had a massive blowout and then you've already got a sector lined up that's a sector that's already like hated and trading at a cheap valuation so you go in there and you just get a maximum um, margin of safety like he had one it was an example uh Uzbekistan he went in after a currency devaluation and he picked up the what was the main exchange there so it was trading super cheap nice big monopoly position currency bounces back gets a huge margin of safety and now i think he gets his he gets his original investment and dividends most years <laughs> so yeah i that that's really appealing but obviously a lot more work a lot more flying a lot more boots on the ground so yeah i'll have to wait till the little guys a bit, bit older before i can do that yeah yeah and, and to your point about um you know looking for these hated sectors and distressed areas um um, and I, I know I, I know you know this the answer to this question, but you know this is something I want to pose to the audience. What do you guys think is the most uh, is the best performing stock over the last thirty years? TikTok, TikTok. All right, it's tobacco, right? Mm -hmm. If you if you traded tobacco from nineteen eighty all the way up until maybe not the last thirty years, thirty years, but from nineteen eighty to twenty ten, something along those lines, like Altria stock. Look that up. That's been you know moving steadily on up um over those last over those 30 years from the 80s all the way up to the 2010s um and tobacco was you know the most hated thing um under the sun um dur during that time so it, it just goes to show you know coal is you, know, you can liken coal and all of these um i guess hydrocarbon forms of energy 
you know, to something like that um, in the eyes of, you know, the, the green energy uh, movement. So, yeah, there's, there's some interesting parallels to be drawn between like coal and, and um, tobacco. It's the, well, like tobacco, part of the reason it just was so strong was the way they were trying to essentially destroy the industry was also like creating a massive moat around the incumbents. So just the fact that you couldn't advertise, you couldn't even, if you were a new brand that wanted to get into the sector, you couldn't even, you would had to be put behind the, like the desk in the, in the, in the shop. So there was no, the, the incumbents were just had a massive regulatory moat around them. They, um, yeah, couldn't be touched. And from there they could just, yeah, print cash flow and that, yeah, the demand was far stronger than the sort of the destruction, the price destruction from having prices put up. And interesting with coal is it's, it's I've, I've labeled coal before as like a sort of a break the glass sort of solution for policymakers every time they do something done with a green transition. So every time they, they project something that can't happen, they're going to have to go back to coal. And meantime, coal, the supply is just constantly getting getting smashed, especially high quality coal. So there's there's a decent amount of like low quality coal that you can get from open pit mines, but the, the sort of underground higher quality coal, you've got longer lead times, far more capex. And a lot of that stuff's like um, in Australia. And it's just when you've depressed the valuations where you are, it just makes more sense for them to buy back stock than um, do big, big sort of developments. Like they, can, they can't make the investment case work if they can just buy back their stock at two times cash flow. And so I do see, yeah, parallel. Like even some of the, I was looking through Twitter before and some people sort of hating on the likes of um, Whitehaven Peabody at the moment with um, obviously the pricing collapsed. It's even far below where I thought was conservative for like Newcastle pricing. But the thing is when, when you're like Whitehaven still trading at sort of half aftermarket cap of cash, still knocking out cash flow. Yes, it isn't what it was like last year. But you actually want a stock to be quite depressed when you're buying back a lot of stock. Super accretive to you to keep shrinking the float at like a decreased valuation. And so it's as attractive as ever been. Granted, you've kind of done the work to understand all the flaws in um, supposedly this 100% net zero move, this like renewable build out. I just think it, it can't work. Just physics is not on its side. And that means as long as we keep pushing these silly policies, coal is going to be what we keep falling back to. And if they start adopting smarter policies, it'll be nuclear. So I've often said like coal and uranium are almost like a, a nice hedge for each other. One's dumb political policy, the other's smart political policy, and ideally hopefully make money on both of them, but they do hedge each other in a way. Yeah, totally. And um, you know, while we're talking about uh, nuclear and uranium in general, um, if you actually look at institutional buying in an ETF like URA, for example, you'll notice mm -hmm. that as the price goes down in URA, the volume of institutional buying has actually gone up. Like it's the mm -hmm. highest now that's been in like, you know, I guess, I don't know if it's since inception, but definitely since in the last five years. Um, I, yeah. I actually looked at this in one of my older videos. Um, so, it's, you know, to your point there, when you, you know, refer to the fact that retail um, it's mainly retail dr driving all these, you know, probably driving all these prices down uh, just because of the nature mm -hmm. of retail. It's, they, you know, the the propensity to, to chase a shiny object, et cetera. Um, yeah. So, well, we got you talking about uranium. Uh, what do you, you know, what, what's your kind of take on uranium at the moment? Uh, sorry, I just want to mention one other thing with tobacco and coal that I forgot yeah. completely was, um, was this institution's been kept out of it. That's the other thing of it. It can't have a sort of a multiple re-rate if people can't buy it. And so um, that was the other thing that you can't inherently have a value trap if it's very cash flow positive. You'll just, right. you'll earn your way out with buyback and buybacks, dividends. And like, I think, I don't know, I'll be interested in that chart with tobacco. I think, I don't know if you can run like the total return if you just reinvest in dividends. Like it would be even more astronomical than their just um, their standard sort of stock performance. Um, yeah, with buybacks, like they bought back a ton of stock. But um, yeah, I see that as well as I I don't know like the the whole sort of um, 
green net zero narrative would have to be pretty pretty dead before you'd see a lot of the firms um, jump back into coal. Like I think I think they'll squeeze the hell out of uranium first as like a sort of a we're, we're already seeing a lot of the renewable um, stocks start to underperform pretty heavily. I've done some deep dives on the likes of like like the wind turbine manufacturers like sort of having negative ten percent margins after increasing costs thirty percent. Like they're just they're in trouble and they're supposed to be scaling and they're not profitable and losing money. So I see there being quite a big sort of ESG chase of uranium to try and um, to try and buff up their performance again. But yeah, sorry, I just wanted to touch on that before because I think I like skipped over that whole institutional ownership. It's um it's just a different form of investing to go into something knowing that you're going to earn your way out just with, with cash flow, regardless of if there's any multiple um, expansion, which I wouldn't hold my breath with uranium uh, with coal for a long time. Yeah. Nice. So what do you what uh what's your current take on the uranium market? We're currently sitting at 54 some odd dollars. Um where so we the 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 metal itself has actually been trending up. You know, yeah. very steadily. Like, well, if you like draw a trend line, you can clearly see it. But the equities have been kind of in, a, in somewhat of a doldrum. Uh, what do you think is going on there? Yeah, so it's just a just a waking game with uranium. Everyone always gets impatient. It's an opaque market. So even even looking at spots, a bit of a bit of a um, thin bullshit market. Like the the real market's a term term market where all the um, the utilities have to come and start. Um, start kind of trying to contract and there isn't enough to go around. This is going to be a game of musical chairs that everyone's been guessing when it's going to end. And it, it's always, it's always dragged out another few years, but um, yeah, the, the mass doesn't work. There's X number of utilities and there's not enough pounds being mined to go around. So there will be a squeeze at some point. And um, I stay away from predicting when it'll be, but I'm happily sitting on all my uranium stocks and, um, I think it is inevitable at some point and it seems to we're getting more and more help with more and more of these physical vehicles kind of like cornering the market and hoovering up pounds and so yeah it'll it'll all look um it'll all look hot, obvious in hindsight but everyone will forget how painful it was waiting for this for for years and years I thought I was far closer when I got into it in 2020 I would have said probably a year or two now here we are <laughs> halfway through 2023 20, and Feels like it's probably still a year away. So yeah, I'm not getting any. I wouldn't have any idea of time frame. I just know that it it is inevitable, and um, otherwise all these multi multi billion dollar reactors are, are going to power down, and they they need to buy for years. So they don't they don't just buy what they need on the short term. They like over or over contract, and that's that's another thing that will just squeeze this this market. Not to mention the uranium market itself is tiny. Like I know I've. Back when I first got in it in 2020, like some of the small, the small sort of um, miners are thinking of Forsyth when I first got in, and I think I moved the stock price myself fine a little bit. And I'm like, Jesus, like how is institutional money going to come into this market and start chasing it? It'll be, yeah, uh, this will get squeezed. Um, but yeah, I've had, after buying a large slab in March 2020, I haven't really um, done much of it. I've just sat on it. Yeah, and it's happened yeah. before too. Like the yeah. uh, the big move in what is it oh six oh seven like there was yeah. definitely you know institutional um, shenanigans going on there. I mean we had I think it was UPC at the time during Participation Corp, and yeah. hedge funds just squeezed that sucker on up, and then like their position in the equities beforehand, and uh, you know, just let her rip. Yeah, well, it's Cuffy's take that it's it's got. There's a, a big similarity between the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Like it's just, mm. um, yeah, you've just got um, got limited supply and someone that can just keep raising the bid. It's just inevitable that it's going to end with a squeeze at some point. And as long as you're patient, you um, don't need the capital. Like a, the physical uranium is, yeah, I think it's one of the best risk rewards. It's just understanding that none of none of this makes sense till uranium's getting up around hundred dollars a pound like none of this is is not going to not going to be enough supply brought on so until we get there um it's a very very low um uh very low risk great risk reward and so yeah i'm just hanging out more in the equities because i know they're going to have 
some pretty heavy talk compared to the um, the physical itself. Granted, yeah, you've got all sorts of shenanigans like going on in Africa. Like we've just recently had this. Uh, I'll carry on with Namibia. I've got some pretty heavy holdings in um, in some of the Namibian uranium companies, and it wasn't wasn't nice seeing them. Down, they rebounded tonight, though. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw that this morning. I was like, it's pretty much back where this whole thing started. Yeah, just <laughs> bullshit. Yeah, so it gives you a heart attack when you open your cow. Like, what happened there? And then back to where you started. Should have, should have traded it, but yeah, didn't yeah. enough cash. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I felt like when when I first checked my account, I was like, well, I'm glad I'm position sized accordingly. You know, like I don't, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't like go over five percent or you know, like somewhere in that ballpark, but. Um, you know, looking back back at it now in hindsight, you get the feeling of, oh, I should just buy more when it was down 20% just last night. Yeah. But yeah. Um, well, you, you can. Yeah, I've, I've, I had a trade that I did. Um, I can't remember when it was. I think it was last year or maybe even the year before when there was that, um, it would have been last year with a fire at the um, the Ukrainian reactor, nuclear reactor. Yeah. And everything got absolutely smashed then. And then when sort of, reading through the news turned out it was just like some some shit at the back of the reactor you think this is completely overdone so put on a few bull calls yeah you can yeah do have some advantages like that but um yeah Yeah. on the whole it's just there's so much anxiety in this trade like that's what i've noticed like there's so many people are just like so anxious about every little event and just ready to pull the trigger yeah it's it's not a good sign to even be in trades like that honestly like i think um being in more liquid stuff that no one even wants to touch like it's what i've learned a lot from my mentor brad he's the most comfortable hanging out and something that's just been crawling along the bottom of a chart for yeah. a few years and it's just poking its head up that's where as we we're talking about before it's just all insiders maybe a few deep value investors and um you've just got such a good low risk reward as soon as something starts to ramp and get on everyone's screen then everyone sort of jumps in and invariably it's got to roll over because yeah, there's just too many tourists aboard. Got to capsize the boat for a bit and wash them out before it, even with a good fundamental story. Like kind of if you look at Whitehaven, like that's given up most of the last year's performance and um, the fundamentals are as good as ever. It's just anyone that doesn't know why they're investing in it um, has jumped off. They've got no faith in uh, Newcastle coal coming back. I think there's even been a few reports circulated that it's going to do a full mean reversion, which is not far off now. And yeah, you've just got to, you've done your homework and have a strong, strong view on the commodity. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at like the equities over the last two, three years and versus the actual commodities, it could be anything. It could be uranium. It could be the precious, me- uh, maybe not the precious metals, but it could be, um, you know, not gas, oils, wh- whatever. Uh, the equities have largely outperformed the the commodities themselves. Do you think that'll continue be the case, or will we see a switching where the commodities begin to outperform the the equities just because of stuff like uh, margins being squeezed due to higher input costs and that kind of thing? Um, I think the equities will continue to outperform, but yeah, it'll be you'll have a lot of disasters along the way. Like you have a lot of yeah, it's. It, it's always a sort of debate I have with and say something like oil where you can choose between going into like um, producers or even explorers. You can just go for the straight clean play on something like a WTI futures option, which is, is quite appealing at times because it's um, you cut out all the operation and jurisdictional risk. Like, there's literally nothing worse in this, in this game than being spot on with where you think the underlying commodity is going to go and then losing your shirt because it was a, uh, so some, some sort of a yeah they got the mine taken off them or they they just did something dumb operationally or they just dilute you to um high heaven and so i uh, the the equities will definitely outperform but again there'll be a lot of horror stories of people putting all their eggs in the in the basket and it not working out so i think um yeah, for the standard investor, like with uranium, it's probably smarter just to buy the physical and just be happy with um, physical overshooting at some point because you've taken so little risk. Whereas with most of the equities, you just you're taking on, you're getting diluted. Like the the cost inflation is pretty crazy across this. Um, like I think even Xanaprom and Paladin are running like 30, 40 percent cost inflation. So those guys have already 
um, already having mines can imagine what developers are going to get hit with when they're trying to bring mines um, online in the years to come. So um, just more dilution, all the um, yeah, all the sort of mine plans is going to be yeah. If, if they're a few years old, you they probably have to <laughs> sharpen the pencil when they come back to the board to redo them, especially if like oils um, where going where I think it is. If it's sort of um, well north of a hundred bucks, and of course that's going to feed into all the stuff. It's a, I think it's a point I've touched on quite a few times. It's like everyone asks why aren't and um, and more of like the battery metals, like why I'm playing copper or something. Can I just see you you separate commodities between like opex commodities and more capex commodities, and if um, the opex commodities are sort of operational, mainly oil, coal to an extent for a lot of industrial processes, but um, they're going to flow into the others, and so you're going to a lot of this price spike is going to take off first will be energy and it will flow into copper and copper will take off. But I think you'll, um, you'll get far more of uh, far more volatility being in the energy space and far, far more upside in my view. Yeah. And especially versus precious metals. I, I kind of see the energy outperforming precious metals by a wide margin over the next decade. Yeah. I think it'll be similar to the, you can bring up charts from the sort of seventies and eighties and bring it right forward to today. And even though oil was quite expensive and gold was quite cheap, um, oil still outperformed gold by at least ten percent a year for um, over that period. Is it, isn't there like yeah, yeah? Isn't there like an order of operations with like capital rotation, like in commodity super cycles, where you initially see the energy stocks rise and then you see, you know, the, the metals rise and then the precious metals come last. Is, is that yeah. how it is? Yeah, I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen like that displayed in the chart, but yeah, it kind of makes sense um, when you say it like that. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen any research on it or anything, but no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about nat gas? Are you, uh, are you playing with that at all? where it's at no so i i play I, I did originally when it was just super cheap cheap out of kind of covid but um i think i was um in ontario um resources played that for a while but now i i just view coal as kind of a proxy for gas so um with with gas you've got um it's actually really hard to kind of play lng and play like you can see what um ttf and um and I'm forgetting what the Asian one is, J, this JMI. The um, you see what the sort of the gas the exchanges do there, but gas is traded with like far higher multiples, and everyone kind of gets the argument far more. It's just not as hated as coal. You get you get a um, you get a far better valuation of coal, and you I feel like you get a lot of the sort of the upside with a lot more with far larger margin of safety with coal. So I've kind of played it that way. And they, they both go hand in hand. So yeah, my main plays are still the likes of like Peabody and Whitehaven is how I kind of um kind of try and capture natural gas. And it's also yeah, far more volatile, which is um not that coal hasn't been volatile now. And I'm saying this, it's it's drawn down just as much. Yeah. Um, so what about like outside the commodity space? Do you see anything that meets your criteria of you know distress? sector and hated is there anything outside of the commodity space that you're currently in as well um oh i'm in a lot of stuff that's not like just like a kind of a service related to commodities so mm. like the enough that's what you're asking kind of like the offshore service vehicles like the servicing the rigs and then the rigs are obviously um oil services um also product tankers uh, own a decent whack of them so like shifting fuel around so like So um, overall, no, I've got I've got no exposure outside of sort of commodity derivatives. Yeah, um, the, the closest I come is I like a lot of the yeah like the frontier markets. Like as I said, if I get a big exit, I'll be um, out of some of these stocks. I'll be looking to put money to work in some frontier markets, um, like Africa, like Uzbekistan. Um, I really like that idea of going into kind of situations where there's just been a 
currency devaluation. I'm thinking of Michael, he, he went to Sri Lanka just after um, the big devaluation, um, the sort of the big crisis there and was picking up a few assets um, at that time that he'd had his eye on. That, that really appeals to me. Um, like further down the track, maybe more property. But um, yeah, for now, no, I'm pretty much... Hey. Sorry, is that li is that line speed okay? Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I think it was from my end though, so my apologies. Okay. Yeah, I think it was my internet. But all right, so the last thing I heard was that uh, you weren't in um, nothing outside of the service um, no. sectors. Yeah. No. Okay. No. Got it. Cool. Um, so how long do you think this uh this super cycle, this commodity super cycle, is going to last? How much? How much? Uh, you know, does it still have a lot of legs left? left in it yeah i think it'll be the better part of a decade i think okay. this, this stuff doesn't resolve quickly the um who was jeff curry put it best it was like it'll be three years before institutional money will join in because they don't pick inflections they want to see a clear trend in place then once they start investing it'll take three years for the um the sector to start to absorb that capital and then with that capital in play, it'll need at least six years before all like the supply kind of comes online. Kind of <laughs> inherently kind of makes sense is um yeah, yeah, we're got a long runway. And especially if you're in stuff that's just going back to um things that are hard to replicate, like hard to replace, like just a mm. just a we're a bad drill ship. The uh, the shipyards are still full of um building whether it be lng tankers whether it be um some of the more bulk carriers um there's no sort of space for a number of years and then even if they can then get space then it's going to take another few years to to build build the the um the rigs and so you've just got this this window of like minimum sort of five years before they could even start to come online and so i just want to kind of keep replicating that trade where i get the biggest moat and you can see the the sort of highest level of kind of excess earnings being maintained for as long as possible. And yeah, the same can be said for obviously mines that you can get cheap. Like the the one that always comes to mind is Peabody with having gone through a bankruptcy and written off a whole heap of debt. Um, you've got all their their mines now sort of being held on the books for cents on the dollar really with all that debt gone. So a whole lot of stuff like that will just be I see them being cash cows moving forward and um, yeah, looking forward to the next few years. Got it. What, what about CapEx? Are you seeing CapEx start to pick up anywhere in any any of these sectors or no? Not really. Like you're still seeing it at all times low, like cash flows there, but the sort of reinvestment, I've got some good charts on coal CapEx is still, uh, still like just crawling along the bottom. Like obviously no one believes um, that's, there's any need for coal moving forward so the um, investment's just not there oil i think it's um oil reinvestment still at a multi multi-decade low i believe and even though cash flow has jumped out so it's just all shareholders are on the back of being burned so badly and shale are just demanding sort of um demanding capital be returned to them whether it buybacks or dividends and so it's um still kind of just making this whole um issue worse yeah there's so i think we've definitely seen the bottom and the lows and like just lack of investment it is starting to pick up but it's still pretty anemic yeah no nowhere where it needs to be and it's also interesting when you think about it that every year that goes by you need to spend more with higher cost inflation and also just then like just straight inflation like it's um yeah like with the the dollar getting <laughs> like debased it quite a rate like if you kind of earmark this is what should have been spent and um so sort of this many hundred billion should have been spent over this period of years well that hundred billion isn't worth what this hundred billion is in the next five years like if you've had um sort of high single digit inflation for a few years that's you gotta you gotta add a few more um yeah. a bit more money to get that same sort of real purchasing power hmm. it, it's, it's like being in, in a, on an empty stomach like if you go a day without eating, 
then you go another day without eating. If you have two days without eating, all of a sudden you're going to have to eat more food than you would have had you only gone one day without eating, right? The yeah. longer, the more days you go without eating, the more food you're going to need to get back into, I guess, equilibrium, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, where can people find you, Trader Berg? Um, so I have a sub stack, which I put out sort of a weekly email. I just call it Ferg's Finds. It's uh, the best article, podcast, uh, quote, uh, chart and um, tweet and something I'm pondering that I've come across. It's free. I just um, put it out there to try and get some value. So that's probably uh, first thing I'd recommend. So just um, join that, uh, my Twitter, and I've also got a show on Crux. Yeah, so those are really the only places I'm um, I'm on the internet. Yeah, so probably just yeah start with a Substack. That's um, and see if you like what I'm putting out, and yeah, follow along from there. All right, very good. Uh, any closing comments before we sign off? Uh no, not really. No, I thought it was a good chat. Yeah, I um, covered everything. I think wanted to um, okay. to go over. Sounds good. Well, guys, if you enjoy this content, be sure to give this video a like. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more guests like uh, Trader Ferg here. And I, with that said, I will see you in the next video. Bye, y'all.